live from Boston, Massachusetts. It's the Cube covering Spark Summit East 2017. Brought to you by Databricks. Now, here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and George Gilbert. Everybody, where the euphoria is still palpable here, and uh, we're in downtown Boston at the Heinz Convention Center for Spark Summit East. Hashtag Spark Summit, my co host and I. George Gilbert will be unpacking what's going on here for the next two days. George, it's good to be working with you again. I always love Likewise, working Dave. with my man, George Gilbert. We go deep, George goes deeper. Um, so, you know, really fantastic um, action going on here in Boston. Actually, quite a, quite a good crowd here. It was packed this morning in the keynotes. The rave is streaming. Everybody's talking about streaming. Let's sort of go back a little bit though, George. When Spark first came onto the scene, you saw this, you know, these projects coming out of Berkeley. Uh, it was the hope of bringing real-timeness to big data, uh, dealing with some of the memory constraints uh, that we found, going from batch to kind of real-time interactive and, and now streaming, you're going to talk about that a lot. And then you had sort of IBM come in and put a lot of dough behind Spark, basically giving it a, a stamp, you know, IBM's imprimatur, yeah. much in the same way it did with, with Linux, yeah. kind of elbowing its way in to yeah. the marketplace and sort of gaining a, a foothold. Many people at the time thought that Hadoop needed Spark more than Spark needed Hadoop. A lot of people thought that Spark was going to replace Hadoop. Um, where are we today? What's the state of big data? Okay, so to set some context, um, when Hadoop uh, V1, classic Hadoop came out, it was the file system, commodity file system, keep everything really cheap, don't have to worry about um, shared storage, which was very expensive. And the processing model, the execution of munging through data was MapReduce. We're all you know, familiar with those terms. Complicated, but dirt cheap. Yes. Relative to a traditional data warehouse. Yes. So don't, don't buy a big Oracle Unix box or a Linux box, buy you know, this new file yeah. system and figure out how to make it work and you'll save a ton of money. Yeah, but, it, but unlike, unlike our, the traditional RDBMSs, it wasn't really that you know, great for doing sort of interactive uh, business intelligence and things like that. It was really good for um, sort of big batch jobs that would run overnight or periods of hours, things like that. And um, the, the irony is when Matei Zahari, or the co-creator of Spark, or actually the creator and co-founder of Databricks, which is a steward of Spark, when, when he created the language or, and the execution environment, his objective was to do a better MapReduce than we do, than MapReduce. Um, make it faster, take advantage of memory, but he did such a good job of it that he was able to extend it to be a uniform engine, not just for MapReduce type batch stuff, but for streaming stuff. So originally they started out thinking, that this, if I get this right, yeah. so it was a sort of a micro batch leveraging memory more effectively, and then it extended beyond the micro that batch was there is, is their current way to address the streaming stuff. Okay. So that it takes MapReduce, which would be you know, big, long-running jobs, and they can slice them up, and so each little slice turns into an element in a stream. Okay, so the, the point was this, it was improvement upon these big, big long batch jobs, yeah. make, making it kind of, you think about batch to interactive and, and, and real time, but so, you know, let's go back to big data for a moment. Yeah. You know, big data was the, the hottest topic in the world three or four years ago, and now it's sort of waned as a buzzword, uh, but, Big data is now becoming more mainstream. We've talked about that a lot. Um, a lot of people think it's done. Is big data done? No, it's more that it's sort of, it's boring for us kind of pundits to talk about because it's becoming part of the fabric. And the use cases are what's interesting. It started out as a way to collect all data into this really cheap storage repository. And then once you did that, this was, this was the data you couldn't afford to put in your Teradata you know, data warehouse at 25,000 per, ter per terabyte or with running costs, a multiple of that. So here you put all your data in here, you your data scientists and data engineers started munging with the data. Um, you started taking workloads off your data warehouse like ETL things that didn't belong there. And then now people are beginning to experiment with business intelligence, sort of exploration and reporting on Hadoop. So taking more, more workloads off the data warehouse. And um, the limitations, there are limitations there that will get solved by putting sort of MPP SQL backends on it. But the next step 
after that. So we're, we're, we're working in, on that step, but the one that comes after that is make it easier for data scientists to use this data to create predictive models Okay, for so I often joke that the, the ROI on big data was reduction on investment, lowering the, the denominator yeah. in the expense equation, which I think, I think it's fair to say that big data and Hadoop succeeded in achieving that. But then the question becomes, okay, what's the real business impact? Clearly big data has not, ex except in some edge cases, and there are a number of yeah. edge cases and examples, but it's not yet, anyway, lived up to the promise of real time affecting outcomes before, you know, taking the human out of the decision, bringing transaction and analytics together. Now, but we're, we're hearing a lot of that talk around AI and machine learning. Of course, IOT is the next big thing. That's where streaming fits in. Is it, is it, is it same wine, new bottle, or is it sort of the evolution of, of the data meme? It's, it's an evolution, but it's not just a technology evolution to make it work. Because when we were, we've been talking about big data as efficiency, like low cost, cost reduction for the existing type of infrastructure. But when it starts going into machine learning, you're doing applications that are more strategic and more top line uh, focused. And that means um, your C-level execs actually have to get involved because they have to talk about the strategic objectives like growth versus profitability or which market, markets you want to target first. So has, <clears throat> has Spark been uh, a headwind or a tailwind to Hadoop? Um, I think it's very much been a, a tailwind because it, it simplified a lot of things that took many, many engines in Hadoop, and that's something that Matei, creator of Spark, has been talking about for a while. Okay, something I learned today, and actually I'd heard this before, but, but the way I phrased it in my tweet was genomics is kicking Moore's Law's ass. Yeah. Right, that, that the price performance of, of sequencing a gene improves 3x every year to what is you know, ostensibly a doubling every 18 months for Moore's Law, and, and then the amount of data that's being created is just enormous. I think uh, we heard from from the Broad Institute that they create 17 uh, uh, terabytes a day yeah. as compared to YouTube, and which is 24 terabytes years, a day. It'll be, it'll be way, it'll be yeah, dwarfing the, YouTube, and of course yeah. Twitter you couldn't even see. Yeah. Uh, so, so what do you make of that? Is that just, just a fun fact? Is that a new use case? Or is, is that really where this whole market is headed? It's, it's not a fun fact because we've, we've been hearing for, for years and years about this study about data doubling every 18 to 24 months. That's coming from the legacy storage guys who can only double their capacity every 18 to 24 months. The reality is that when we take what was analog data and we make it, you know, we make it digitally accessible, the only thing that's sort of preventing us from capturing all this data is the cost you know, to acquire and manage it. So it's, the available data is growing much, much faster than you know, 40% um, every 18 months. Well, so what you're and saying is that, I mean, this, this industry has marched to the cadence of Moore's Law for, for decades, and what you're saying is that that sort of linear curve is, is actually reshaping, it's becoming exponential. For, for, for data. Yes. And so the pressure is on for compute, which is now the bottleneck, to get cleverer and cleverer about how to process So that, that says innovation has to come from elsewhere, not just Moore's Law. It's got to come from a combination of, of more, you know, Tom, uh, T uh, Thomas Friedman talks a lot about Moore's Law being one of the fundamentals, but there are others. Right. Um, so from a data perspective, what are those combinatorial effects that are going to drive innovation forward? Well, there's, there's some, there was a big meetup for Spark last night and the, the focus was this new da uh, database called Snappy Data that spun out of Pivotal and is being mentored by Paul Moritz, mm -hmm. ex you know, head of development at Microsoft in the 90s um, and former head of VMware. Um, the inter interesting thing about this database, and we'll start seeing it in others, is you don't necessarily want to be able to query and analyze petabytes at once, it'll take too long, sort of like munging through data of that size on Hadoop took too long you can do things that approximate the answer and get it much faster. We're going to see more tricks like that. You know, it's interesting, you mentioned um, Moritz. I heard a lot of messaging this morning that talked about um, essentially you know, real-time analysis and being able to make decisions um, on data that you've never seen before and actually affect outcomes. These are, this narrative I heard, first heard from Moritz many, many years ago when they launched Pivotal. Um, so, you know, he launched Pivotal to be this platform for building big data apps, yeah. and now you're seeing sort of Databricks and others sort of usurp that messaging and actually seeming to be at the center 
of that trend. What's going on there? Um, I, I think there's, there's two, um, sort of two, uh, what, what would you call it, two centers of gravity. And our CTO, David Floyer, talks about this. The edge is becoming more intelligent because there's a, a huge bandwidth and latency gap between these smart devices at the edge, whether the smart device is like a car or, what, or a drone or just a, a, a bunch of sensors on a turbine. Um, those things need to analyze and respond in near real time or, or, or hard real time, like how to tune themselves, things like that. But they also have to send a lot of data back to the cloud to learn about um, how these things evolve, you know, to, to learn, in other words, it would be like sending the data to the cloud to figure out how the weather, weather patterns are changing. Mm -hmm. That's the analogy, you need them both. Okay. And, and uh, so Spark right now is really good in the cloud, but they're, they're doing work so that they're, they can take a lighter weight version and put it at the edge. But we've also seen Amazon put some stuff at the edge and, and Azure as well. I, I want you to comment, we're going to talk about this later. We have, uh, George and I are going to do a two part series at this event. Uh, we're going to talk about the state of the market and then we're going to release our uh, big data, you know, glimpse to our big data numbers, our Spark forecast, our streaming forecast. And I say I mentioned streaming because that is sort of, the, we, we talk about batch, we talk about interactive slash real time. You know, you're at a, at a terminal, <laughs> everybody, anybody, anybody as old as I am remembers that. But now you're talking about streaming. Streaming is a, is a new workload type. You call these things continuous apps, like streams of events. Uh, coming into a call center, for, for example, is one example yeah. that you use. Uh, add some color to that. Talk okay. about w that new workload type and the role of streaming, and, and really, potentially, how it fits into IoT. Okay, so for the last 60 years, since the birth of modern, com modern well, since the birth of digital computing, we've had either uh, one of two workloads. They were either batch, which is jobs that you know, ran offline. You, you put your punch cards in and sometime later the, the answer comes out. Um, or we've had interactive, which is, you know, originally it was green screens and you know, now we have um, PCs and mobile devices. The third one coming up now is continuous or streaming data that you act on in near real time. And it's not that those apps will replace the previous ones, it's that you'll have apps that have continuous processing, batch processing, interactive as a mix. And an example would be today, um, all the information about how your applications and your data center infrastructure are operating, that's a lot of streams of data that Splunk first took, took aim at and did very well with. So that you're, you know, you're looking in real time and able to figure out you know, if something goes wrong. Um, so, but that type of stuff, all the telemetry from your data center, that is a training wheels for Internet of Things, where, where you've got lots of stuff out at the edge. It's interesting you mentioned Splunk. Splunk actually doesn't use the, the big data term in its marketing, but they yeah. actually are big data, and yeah. they are streaming. They're actually, they're actually not talking about it, they're just doing it, but um, at any rate. All right, George, uh, great, thanks for that, that overview. Um, we're going to break now, bring back our first guest, Arun Murthy, coming in from, uh, from Hortonworks, co-founder at Hort Hortonworks. So uh, keep it right there, everybody. This is theCUBE. We're live from Spark Summit East. Hashtag Spark Summit. We'll be right back. Thank you.